The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast. I'm your host, Sean Haney of Real Agriculture. The Pest and Predator podcast features interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. They've got the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Dr. Tyler Wist. He is a research scientist with Field Crop Entomology at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada based out of Saskatoon. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. Hey, Tyler, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well, Sean. Thanks. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Looking forward to uh, today's discussion on the Pest and Predator podcast. So, Tyler, what pests are we going to be discussing today? So, we're talking about a pest called the Wheathead Armyworm today. And then we're going to talk about uh, something that's killing the Wheathead Armyworm. And that's, that's a good thing. That's what we want to hear about. So, the, the Wheathead Armyworm, it, it impacts wheat, but it, it, does it attack barley as well? So the wheathead armyworm, yeah, you'll find it in wheat, but I've been finding it in barley as well. And other cereal crops are not immune to this pest. So you'll find them in rye and oats. They even get into wild oats, which is essentially a good thing. And But also native and forage grasses like timothy. And so this thing has a pretty wide host range. You never really know where it's going to pop up. And it... It has a real impact on yield if the infestation is is substantial, right? So that is an interesting question that I don't think has really been looked at very much. So these lepidopteran pests, so it's a, it's a noctuid like the other armyworms and birth armyworms. So they're all in the same family. And the notoriously bad thing about trying to research these are hard to find. and They just pop up where you don't expect them. You'll get money to study them, and then you'll have a hard time finding them out in the field. So let's call them a really frustrating insect to work on. If you can't get them into a colony, um, like we have a birth armyworm colony, which makes research much, much easier. But I don't think anybody has a colony of wheathead armyworm. So it's got, uh, it's got a scientific name. Um, I actually just did some research on it today, and it used to be called Aronta diffusa, but then somebody went and stuck it into the genus Dargida back in 2005. So now we have to call it Dargida diffusa, according to the taxonomist. So it, uh, you might confuse it with the armyworm, but the armyworm is a totally different genus. And yeah, this is this is the confusing thing with common names is there's so many different insects that have the name armyworm in them that it's going to throw you off. But if you're looking, if you're in a wheat field and you've got a kind of tan colored caterpillar sitting on your wheat head, pretty likely that it's a wheat head armyworm because it's in wheat and it's sitting on the head of the wheat. Not a whole lot of the other ones will be sitting up on the head, feasting on the kernels. Okay. And of course, Pest and Predator podcast, we're talking about beneficials. So, what beneficial insect deals with this pest? Ah. Uh, so back in the 1980s, Dan Johnson wrote about the Wheathead Armyworm. I think that was the first time that it popped up. So he was a, an entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada as well. And he wrote the first report on that. And he uh, he'd sent that to me. Now he's at uh, University of Lethbridge there. And at that time, he didn't record anything killing the Wheathead Armyworm. But in the last couple of years, we've been getting reports of these kind of uh, cottony looking puff balls up on the heads of wheat and barley. And not even just on the head, but if there's awns, they'll be up in the awns. And so I'll often get pictures from agronomists and they'll say, hey, what are these egg looking things up here? Is this the egg of some mega insect? And uh, it's not eggs, they're actually the pupae of a beneficial wasp that parasitizes the wheat head armyworm. And so this beneficial wasp is uh, probably in the genus Cotesia. So we've, we've identified a couple of different species, and this whole 2020 COVID pandemic really put a damper on us getting things identified because uh, all the, the labs in Ottawa are running at low capacity. So we don't have a definitive name for it, but we're pretty sure that it's 
in the genus Cotesia. What's super cool about the genus Cotesia is there's typically only female wasps. And so every single one of those insects that comes out of the pupa is ready to go out and find another um, host. So another caterpillar host to sting and lay an egg into. And so the Cotesia female, she'll fly out there, she'll find the wheathead armyworm caterpillar, and she'll sting it and lay a single egg into it. And that egg splits inside the body of the of the caterpillar into, say, 20 to 30 little larvae that are genetically identical. So this is a this is a um, this is cloning. So it basically the egg clones itself, and you get one egg that turns into 30 offspring, and they're all genetically identical. And they hang around in the body of the wheathead armyworm for a little while, and then all together on mass they start chewing their way out of the body wall of the wheathead armyworm. And if you're lucky enough to see this, you just start seeing these little dark circles appearing on the on the body or the skin of the army worm and then out burst this little larva and they kind of just sit there wriggling as they come out and so then you see 20 or 30 of these things on the side of the caterpillar just wriggling and so then they get their way out and they drop out and they immediately start to uh, use their spinnerets on their heads to spin these pupil cocoons and they cocoon themselves together. And so that's a way to protect themselves from other parasitoids that might want to kill them or other uh, insects that might come along and eat them. Because if you, you know, you take a few bites of this, this Cotesia mass or this Cotesia cocoon mass, um, you'll take a few of the individuals out, but then the genetically identical ones on the other side are okay. And so, couple days after that, maybe about five days, out come these little black wasps and they just start the cycle all over again. So it's uh, ex extraordinarily fascinating. And in 2019, they actually caught that on video, posted it to Twitter pretty wow. quick. So that was fun. That sounds like something out of like a movie, like a horror film from like the 1970s or 80s. Like, wow, that, that is pretty cool. Uh, that's right. I think you're referring to the Alien movie franchise. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, Ridley Scott ripped off parasitic wasps in, uh, in their mode of action. So, in the movie Aliens, you've got, you've got the egg going into a human, and you get one offspring coming out. So, that would be termed a, a solitary endoparasitoid, whereas this Cotesia is a gregarious endoparasitoid, where you get a lot of them coming out of the body of the host so yeah i enjoy watching these scientific movies but i get a little bit angry when i say hey you just ripped off nature that's not <laughs> that's not an original idea but then at the same time i say oh that's pretty cool and so yeah, yeah. the xenomorphs are basically ripped off from from these parasitic hymenoptera but they also have a, a social class as well because the xenomorphs in the alien franchise also have a queen so Ridley Scott kind of took everything about hymenoptera, the social aspects of the higher hymenopterans, and then the parasitic aspect of the lower hymenopterans, and just squished them together into one super cool alien species. If you can handle horror, then it's all good. Because it's pretty gruesome watching that. Yeah, it is gruesome. So, do do these do these Cotesia, Do they are they specific to the wheat? head army worm or is it any kind of army army worm they're looking for so that is a great question and when, once we get the species nailed down we'll know if it has some alternate host but i would say probably and so i'm going to refer to the research of uh, dr vincent hervé who's now working in winnipeg and hopefully he'll be on your podcast at some point too he actually did his phd on these Cotesia wasps. He was working on a specific one, and they wanted to introduce this Cotesia vanessae into fields to do exactly what we're talking about today. And so what his task was in his PhD project was to look for other hosts that this Cotesia would attack, try to get its host range. And so um, if you're trying to introduce something in classical biological control, 
you don't want it to attack things that you don't want it to kill. So you got to check out what its host range is. So maybe I, I can let Vincent tell you more about that once yeah. you interview him. But um, yeah, that is a good question. And probably those, these Cotesia will have some hosts as well that aren't the wheat head armyworm. So yeah, this is a beneficial insect that can do a fantastic job of population control. And wheat head armyworm doesn't, typically outbreak into um you know problem problem populations so it's possible that this cotesia is keeping it in check just to review here the reason that the female needs to sting and lay the eggs in the army worm is because they need that that parasite relationship right <laughs> Yeah, they have this parasite relationship. So what you've got is a parasitoid, which is a special kind of parasite. So a good parasite doesn't kill its host, but a parasitoid does kill its host. So it's not the female that's doing the killing. It's the offspring of the female that does the killing. So the the one that I videotaped, that poor caterpillar, he doesn't look very good, (laughs) but he stays alive for a little while after. And this guy kind of crawled away. And so often you won't see the caterpillar associated with these Cotesia cocoons uh, up in the awns. So, and probably a caterpillar itself wouldn't even crawl up into the awns because those aren't very palatable for them to eat. So there might be some kind of a cue that the Cotesia larvae are controlling the the army worm larvae with that makes it crawl up onto the awns right before the you know the moment of death happens so that's uh that's also something really interesting that parasitic hymenoptera can do is they can inject things like viruses that help to overcome the the uh well the minds of some of their of their uh larvae but also to overcome their immune system so the immune system doesn't attack the eggs that they just put into them. Very cool systems. Yeah. So what should farmers be doing to pr- protect parasitoids like Cotesia? Well, that's a great idea. So we always want to protect these things, but you always need to have a look and make sure that uh, you're at some kind of an economic threshold before you spray. So that would be my suggestion is if you think you're taking a lot of damage from these wheat head army worms, um, then you might want to step in and take action. But uh, we've got this one listed in our Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. I call it the bug book. And uh, so it says that infestations are very sporadic and rarely reach levels that are requiring control. So just leave them alone and you're probably not going to have a problem in your field. Although, let's go back to 2019 here. We had reports of grasshopper feeding damage on some of the kernels that were getting graded at the elevators and we really didn't have any big grasshopper populations anywhere and what i'm thinking happened is that they thought it was grasshopper feeding damage but it was actually wheat head armyworm feeding damage so we had some some pretty good wheat head armyworm pressure in 2019 and also in 2020 but in all these fields we had these cotesia wasps also uh, showing up. And so I was getting people who would find these, I would get them to ship them to me so that we could kind of get an idea of what species we had going on out there. But I'm just going to say it, more research definitely needs to be done on this relationship and on the wheat head armyworm itself and how it interacts with fields. Awesome stuff. Tyler, really appreciate you joining us here today on the Pest and Predator podcast and look forward to the next time we chat. Well, thanks very much for having me and Yeah, thanks again, John. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. Fantastic conversation there with Tyler Wist. The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Stay tuned for more episodes coming up in the coming weeks on the Pest and Predator podcast. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.